Uh, good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I, I want to just start with uh, wishing that everybody is healthy uh, during these uh, really tough times. Uh, in the past couple of months, if not three months, uh, for not only everybody in Indonesia, but I think uh, most people around the world. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a different type of environment that we've been living in. Uh, and I want to just basically uh, start with uh, the premise uh, of uh, three items uh, or three uh, elements. Uh, the first one is with respect to you know, the kind of shock that we've gone through uh, by way of uh, the shocking, overwhelming amount of information that everybody around the world has been receiving through, you know, conventional means or even unconventional means, be it from your friends, your relatives, your professional friends, uh, or, or even, you know, beyond your, you know, one or two degrees of connectivity. Uh, the second type of shock uh, is basically with respect to, uh, you know, the shock to our lifestyle. Uh, we have uh, transgressed uh, from, you know, uh, a normal, if not conventional uh, type of lifestyle to a new one where we're a lot less physical, we're a lot less communal, uh, we're a lot more virtual, we're a lot more... Uh, immobile and inactive uh, and this would have been by way of our you know intention to self-isolate or, or also uh, you know by way of a decree that comes from be it your neighborhood or your city or your even country uh, that that would tell you to basically stay at home and the third type of shock is with respect to the overwhelming uh, degree if not amount of uh, policy uh, responses uh, that would have taken place at, you know, the family level, at the RT level, at the airway level, at the Kalurahan level, at the Kabupaten level, at the provincial level, uh, at the national level, at the regional level, uh, if not, you know, the global or international level, which would come at a rate that is so gigantic, uh, if not gigantically more than whatever we have experienced in the past, that it creates, uh, you know, I think not only confusion, uh, but also anxiety uh, amongst all of us. And, and I think this is uh, uh, a new type of, uh, you know, environment that we're living in. On, on the basis of those three types of shocks, uh, which I've shared with some of you in the past, <clears throat> I want to just lay out... <clears throat> Uh, the next hour or two, uh, you know, a discussion uh, with regards to, you know, number one, uh, the unprecedented nature of the health crisis that we've gone through. Uh, and that will be followed up with, uh, you know, the item number two, which is related to the unprecedented nature of the economic crisis. And I'd, I'd like to end the discussion and hopefully take questions from uh, all of you or many of you or some of you uh, with regards to how we could probably try to come up with some sort of a possible solution uh, for what we're going through, uh, which is not easy. Uh, let me begin with the health-related uh, discussion. If, if you recall a few days ago, I think the, the toll... Uh, in terms of the number of people that would have been infected and the number of people that would have died because of COVID-19 uh, have, you know, has, has skyrocketed. We're looking at about 1.7 million people, give and take, that would have been infected globally. Uh, and we're looking at more than 100,000 people that would have died uh, by way of COVID-19 uh, in the last, uh, you know, three months. Uh, and this is a shockingly uh, short period of time during which uh, not only do we see uh, uh, an enormous number of people that are being infected and dying, but we are actually uh, basically confronted with the mystery of not being able to uh, find a near-term solution for any of the causes of our anxiety. So if we break down the 1.7 million people that would have been infected, uh, we're, we're looking at notable countries that have shown uh, tremendous uh, trends 
uh, inclusive of you know um, Italy that has basically shown a mortality rate uh, of more than 10%, uh, and also the UK that has shown a mortality rate of 10%, uh, whereas uh, notable countries such as the United States and China are showing a mortality rate of uh, around 4%. That, I think, uh, you know, speaks of, if not reflects upon, uh, the degree of preparedness uh, of each nation uh, and also the degree of preparatory steps that they have undertaken to combat the, uh, the, the ongoing COVID-19. Uh, other countries, inclusive of uh, Indonesia, Indonesia has gone through uh, a mortality rate of around 9%. Uh, and, and I think uh, it is important to note uh, in terms of what each country is doing uh, in terms of uh, what and how they're dealing with this COVID-19 development. Okay, we're showing the page here. This basically uh, illustrates uh, the different approaches or the different mortality and, and uh, transmission rates of uh, each country, uh, including some of the ones that I've mentioned before. Uh, right there, you can see uh, China and the United States hovering at around 4%. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, mortality rates and the UK and Italy uh, more notably with uh, much higher mortality rates uh, than the rest. Whereas Indonesia has a mortality rate of around 9%. Uh, mortality rate being defined as the number of deaths uh, over, you know, the number of those that uh, would have been, uh, you know, uh, infected by the virus. If we could go to the next page. That just shows the geographic uh, distribution and density of the transmission uh, across the planet. And if we go to the next page, <clears throat> this is, uh, I think, a chart that could be interpreted as uh, somewhat encouraging uh, in the sense that some countries are likely to turn the corner uh, as we speak, uh, or if not in the near foreseeable future, some other countries have notably turned the corner, inclusive of uh, China, South Korea, uh, and, and Japan. Uh, I wanna just you know, take this moment to highlight uh, what distinguishes some countries from the others. Uh, if, if we take a look at South Korea, I think South Korea has done a tremendous job uh, in terms of massively testing the population. Uh, they have worked their numbers up to basically testing around 20,000 people uh, on a daily basis, uh, whereas the United States, uh, although initially it was starting from a low base, but the United States uh, has ramped up the number of people that they're testing on a daily basis. They're looking at testing uh, around 100,000 people uh, on a daily basis. Uh, whereas Singapore is testing about 2,900 people on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, Malaysia, uh, by way of the recent stimulus package, uh, they're looking at testing between 15 to 20,000 people on a daily basis. Uh, unfortunately, Indonesia is uh, at, at a much lower figure yet. Uh, Indonesia has only tested on a cumulative basis around 30,000 people. Uh, and that basically uh, comes down to about 113 people on a per million basis. Uh, the way to look at how uh, effectively governments, if not countries, are actually dealing with the COVID-19 development uh, could be by way of, uh, you know, the extent to which they're actually testing on a per million basis. If we, if we go take, take a look at the next chart. Okay, this is basically the, the, the financial uh, impact uh, from the COVID-19. But before I dwell into this, let me just uh, try to peel the onion a little bit more on, on what each country is doing uh, to combat uh, the, uh, the COVID-19. The, the South Korean government, as they're testing 20,000 people a day, they've tested more than half a million people a day. And they're actually testing about 10,000 people on a per million basis, okay? So for every 1 million people within any population, 
we have to basically try to figure out how many people they're actually testing. So on a, on, on a, on a ratio of the number of people being tested vis-a-vis -vis 1 million of that population, Korea stands at about 10,000. The United States stands at about seven to 8,000 per 1 million. Singapore stands at about 12,000. Singapore is testing more than 12,000 people on a per million basis. To be fair to all of us, Singapore is a much smaller population than the United States or even India or even China or even Indonesia. Whereas Indonesia is, at, as of today, is only testing 113 people on a per one million basis. Okay, that I think speaks of where we're lacking and the extent to which we've got to ramp up on a healthcare uh, you know, front. Now, let me, let me move on to the economic uh, part of the discussion. Uh, no, if we can go back to the previous page. We have seen the capital markets basically plummet, okay? And when I say capital markets, uh, this is in reference to capital markets around the world. Stock markets in the US, China, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, the UK, and all countries around the world. In essence, the market capitalization of every country's stock market, they have basically plummeted by 30%, just in a matter of six to seven weeks, okay? We have seen some sort of a pickup in the last few days, you know, if we take a look at the, the Dow Jones uh, industrial, you know, the, the, the Dow index, it has basically gone up from 20 something thousand to about 23,000. I'm not of the view that this is a permanent recovery yet. Uh, I'm still of the view that whatever pickup that we've seen in indices of stock markets around the world in the last few days uh, is, is merely episodic. And it's merely episodic on the basis of, I think, people sort of like believing in what could or hoping uh, for what could possibly uh, resolve uh, the COVID-19. But I can tell you unequivocally that I'm of the view that as long as there is no evident resolution with respect to the COVID-19 uh, in the context of this being a health or medical issue, uh, we are still or we should not still be in a position to conceive some sort of a bottom to the capital markets. And, and I, I'm of the view that I think there's still some tail risk to you know, what we have seen with the capital market situation in the last few days. So on that basis, uh, we have seen a decline of value in the capital markets around the world, around $25 trillion. Just to give you a perspective, $25 trillion, uh, that is in US dollars, that is about 25 times the GDP of Indonesia. Indonesia's GDP is $1 trillion. So we've seen a correction of wealth amounting to about 25 times the GDP of Indonesia in a matter of weeks. Now, we can build on this in that we have just seen uh, the unemployment figure in the United States skyrocketing up to 14.7%. Okay, if we were to go back to February, the unemployment rate of the United States in February was merely at about 3.3%. But if we took a look at if we take a look at what had happened in March, the job claims that would have been only about 220,000 in February, it shot up to about 3.5 million. And then in the week after, it shot up again to 5.5. And then in the early part of April, it shot up again to 6.5 million. And on a cumulative basis, the unemployment in the United States hovers at around 17 million, which basically tails to about 14.7% rate of unemployment. Now, I think this is a reckoning uh, for not only the United States, but I think it's a reckoning for us. The reason why I'm highlighting what's happening in the US uh, is that the global economy as of today is much more intertwined with each other, okay? As opposed to 2008, as opposed to 1998, 
or even as opposed to the 1930s, given the fact that the supply chain within the global economy is much more integrated, much more intertwined, much more interconnected, and also the way funding or capitalization of corporations, companies, individuals, right now is much more intertwined, much more globalized, much more interconnected, much more integrated. On that basis, that, on, on, on that basis what I'm saying is that if there's anything that's happening with, within the largest GDP of the world, i.e. the United States, we should be expecting some sort of an effect or an impact from whatever is happening in the capital markets of the United States and also in the unemployment setting in the United States economy. If we go to the next page. Okay, this is an illustration of how the coronavirus or the COVID-19 is likely to affect in terms of the economic and also the social disruptions that are going to take place. First of all, it took place in China. Then we can see the curve moving up and then flattening and then curving down. And then also it's going to be followed by what's going to be happening with the U.S. and Europe. Then it's going to be followed by the developing world, including Indonesia and some other developing economies. What, what this is telling you is that as much as you believe that Let's, let's assume that there could be a recovery in the next quarter or in the next two quarters or in the next three quarters. What we are likely to see is that if there is a geography that is going to recover, let's call it China, okay? And China has been known as the factory of the world. As much as we want to believe that China is going to resurrect itself as a productive capacity, it will not be able to basically sell everything that its capacity is able to produce to the rest of the world by way of the lag in the shocks that are taking place in other parts of the world, inclusive of the United States and Europe, and also the rest of the developing economies. So from an aggregate demand standpoint, the aggregate demand that's supposed to be happening in Europe, in the US, and the developing economies that's supposed to be demanding for the goods and services that are going to be produced in China, they're not still going to be able to buy everything that they have been buying in the past, and they're not still going to be able to buy everything that, the China, is, that China is supposed to be producing for the rest of the world by way of the lag in the nature of their going through this pandemic. Let me pause right there to see if there's any issues with connection or whatever before I continue. Can everybody see the slides? Can everybody listen to or hear what I'm saying? I think it's clear, but... Okay, all right, let me continue and then I'll pause at the right time. If we can okay. go to the next page. Okay. Okay, this chart, basically summarizes the, the, the stuff that I was talking about, okay? From, from a health standpoint or from a healthcare standpoint, the, the United States is already undergoing testing of around 100,000 people per day, which is much higher than what it was two to three weeks ago, which is m way much higher than what it was doing a month or two ago. Uh, and if we take a look at South Korea, South Korea is testing around seven to 8,000 people per day, and they've tested more than half a million people. And if we take a look at Singapore, Singapore, uh, you know, given its relatively small population, they're testing more than 12,000 people on a per million basis. Sorry, let me correct myself. It's not on a per day basis, but on a per 1 million. So the U.S. is testing 100,000 people on a per 1 million basis. South Korea, seven to, 9, 000, seven, seven to 8 thousand on a per you know, one million basis, and Singapore is testing more than 12 thousand, whereas Indonesia is testing only 113 people on a per one million basis. I'm very hopeful that this number is going to spike up to a much larger number. The reason why I keep stressing uh, testing as, as an important part of the game is that uh, as, as you test more and more people, you can actually better determine, if not ascertain, the denominator. 
as you can better ascertain the denominator, you're going to have much greater ability of figuring out uh, how and where you're going to have to lock down. So I, I, I don't see the point of anybody's locking down until and unless that particular zip code or government within that zip code knows exactly the degree of transmission. So without actually knowing with uh, knowing with respect to uh, where and the degree to which our the, tr the transmission has taken place, uh, I, I think it's an exercise of futility in terms of encouraging people to lock down without actually knowing exactly the degree of transmission. So I think this is the most structural, if not most essential part of the healthcare um, uh, stuff that needs to be done uh, by, by any government around the world, not just uh, you know, by the government of Indonesia. If we go to the next page, it, it basically illustrates, no, uh, the one before that, uh, the one that talks about the, the fiscal. Okay, this one talks about, sorry, yeah. the bottom part of this page basically illustrates the differential steps that are being taken by different governments. The United States, uh, in its effort to combat the COVID-19 development, has basically launched a two-prong uh, economic uh, strategy. Uh, the first prong is to basically come out with a fiscal stimulus, which basically said uh, that they're going to basically uh, put on the table $2.2 trillion. Okay. To give you perspective, $2.2 trillion amounts to about 10% of the GDP of the United States. In addition to the fiscal stimulus, the United States has also launched a monetary stimulus package. And we call this a quantitative easing. Okay? And quantitative easing is basically an act of printing money. right? And the United States government has been doing this ever since 2008 by way of the Lehman Brothers crisis in 2008. They, in, in order to basically recapitalize the banking system and some of the financial services and also the automotive industry uh, industries in 2008, they basically decided to undertake a quantitative easing exercise to monetize the balance sheets of all the large companies that are labor intensive and all the large companies that are necessary for basically bringing about recovery for the economy. So the United States through the Fed, which is the central bank of the United States, has basically done quantitative easing amounting to about $5 trillion on a cumulative net basis. The balance sheet of the Fed is about $5 trillion. That's how much on a net basis they have printed. But within that $5 trillion, they have printed $2 trillion just in the last few weeks for the purposes of basically helping out the corporations in the United States, helping out individuals to get their salaries, helping out state and local uh, governments uh, you know, by way of buying up all their municipal bonds and also by way of buying up all the public service you know, services that's necessary for people to be able to go to the hospitals and get, you know, treated and all that good stuff. All right. So let me just, let me just highlight uh, that um, the United States has come up with a fiscal stimulus package of around 10% of its GDP, amounting, 2 .2, amounting to $2.2 .2 trillion. In addition to that, they're doing quantitative easing of about $2 trillion in the last few weeks, uh, whereas the South Korean government has come up with a fiscal a stimulus package amounting to about 3% uh, of its GDP. Uh, it's, it's much lower than what the U.S. government has doing, is, is doing, but they have uh, massive monetary capabilities uh, in addition to the fiscal space. The Singapore government has launched a fiscal stimulus amounting to about $50 billion. That amounts to about 12% of, of, of their GDP. Uh, and Indonesia has launched a stimulus package of about 405 trillion rupees uh, just a, a couple, almost a couple of weeks ago. And, and that amounts to about $25 billion, and it amounts to about 2.5% of Indonesia's GDP. $25 billion is about 2.5% of $1 trillion. So uh, is, is that enough? Uh, in, in my view, and, and I've, I've been saying to some people that that may not be enough uh, in the context of what needs to be done to combat 
the COVID-19 uh, you know, development that has enveloped uh, many people around Indonesia. Now, in, in, in view of all this, uh, if, if we want to, okay, we're back, we're back on. Uh, can we go to the previous page? This is the, the, this is the stimulus package that was done by the United States government, where, where they had basically broken uh, broken the, 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 the package into five categories. The first one of which is the prioritization for individuals amounting to about $600 billion out of the $2.2 trillion. The second category is basically the support for large corporations that are deemed as being labor intensive. They're gonna get about $500 billion. That amounts to about 25% of the stimulus package. The third category is a small businesses, which we call here the UMKM. They're getting about $377 billion, which amounts to about 19%. And the fourth category is the state and local governments, which are getting about $340 billion out of the $2 trillion, amounting to about 17%. And last but not least is the public services, which amounts to about $170 billion. And, and, and this is mainly for, for healthcare, you know, uh, support uh, for the, the people in, in, I mean, in the United States. So it's, it's a staggering amount in total, uh, but, but even now many economists uh, in the U.S. and beyond are of the view that even this $2.2 trillion is not deemed as enough for, you know, the, the potential magnitude of the problem that they're going to go through in the next few months. Uh, if we go to the next page... This is the breakdown of the stimulus package uh, of uh, the Indonesian government, amounting to about $405 trillion. Uh, there is a priority for you know, the social safety net. There's also a priority for the uh, small medium enterprises. And there's also a priority for taxes uh, that need to be paid by various people. Uh, the amount of $405 trillion uh, basically uh, amounts to, uh, you know, the government's ability to increase the fiscal deficit uh, from the permissible 3% to slightly over 5%, okay? And, and, and I view this, uh, I view this uh, as, as an exercise where they basically are still cautious uh, of basically uh, widening the deficit uh, within the fiscal space. Uh, and they want to basically make sure that, you know, they start with whatever they can start with first uh, without actually, you know, uh, going into a much more uh, gigantic uh, number that may be needed for, for the resolution of the COVID-19 uh, development. Now, to the extent that the Indonesian government were to contemplate uh, doing something like what the U.S. government is doing, i.e. 10% of the GDP, or to the extent that the Indonesian government is contemplating, uh, you know, doing what the, the Singaporean government is doing, the Singaporean government is basically undertaking a fiscal stimulus amounting to about 12% of its GDP. Uh, right there, you know that they're going to break, uh, you know, whatever deficit uh, post that they've been you know, breaking or they've been basically complying with in the past. Uh, so if, if it, okay, can we go back? Yeah, can we, stick, can, can we stick with this chart? To the extent that the Indonesian government is, is contemplating going to about 10% of the GDP, then we're, we're, we're looking at, at number one, a much bigger number than the 405 trillion. Uh, roots uh, that's going to be needed for helping out with uh, the, the millions of people that would have been affected in Indonesia. But it's also going to imply the widening of the deficit, which uh, unfortunately could take us to a double digit scenario. Uh, that, that I think opens up for, for you know, various discussions on, on a number of topics. Now let's go to the next page. I think on a, on a very encouraging note, the Indonesian government has uh, successfully launched uh, a bond uh, issuance uh, almost uh, a week and a half ago. It was well priced. You know, the amount was $4.3 billion and it was basically chunked out into three durations uh, a 10 year duration, and a 30 year duration, and a 50 year duration. Um, and they were able to actually issue the bonds uh, at, at a very attractive 
uh, yield of around 4.3%. And, and this is unusual in the sense that, you know, given what we have been seeing in the capital markets uh, in the last few weeks, there has been a tendency of cost of capital uh, moving up uh, or becoming more uh, than in the past uh, for particularly emerging markets. And the reason for, for the cost of capital for emerging economies to have gone up in recent weeks is that there has been some sort of a stress on the debt market. There's also been some sort of a stress on the credit market. There's also been some sort of a stress on liquidity uh, because of most of the liquidity, because of the fact that most of the liquidity has been chasing uh, quality. Uh, there, there is a term called flight to quality. And a lot of this liquidity has been basically chasing uh, risk-free rate instruments, such as the treasury notes and the treasury bills. Uh, and this is evidenced by the fact that the yield that would have been offered by the treasuries to attract money has come down because, you know, it didn't have to be as expensive as it would have been in the past to get money uh, to buy up treasuries because, uh, you know, there's so much money now chasing uh, the treasuries uh, and the, the, the treasury uh, yield has come down to around, I believe, 0.7%. Um, just a year or two ago, this was hovering at around 2%. So that, I think, has uh, basically substantiated the, the thinking uh, of, of liquidity uh, flying towards quality, uh, naturally at the expense of uh, those instruments that would be deemed as of uh, less quality. And unfortunately, that would include emerging markets. The point I'm trying to make here is that this chart illustrates, uh, I think, uh, the, 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 the perfect execution uh, as for the government to actually get liquidity from the market. But it also underlines the point that we may not be able to get, you know, this kind of money at this kind of price again. If we were to go, go out to the market and try to get this kind of money, we may be exposed to a much more expensive uh, cost of capital. I hope I'm wrong. If, if we go to the next page, this is a very telling chart, okay? If, if you take a look at just the left bottom part of the chart, it's pretty much flat in terms of the unemployment rate in the US, but just in a period of nothing, this one has basically shot up like a letter I, okay? And on a cumulative basis, the, the unemployment figure in the U.S. has gone up to about 17 million people. So at the moment, there is more than 17 million people in the United States that are unemployed. Okay. And that basically translates to about 14.7% unemployment rate. And in February, the unemployment rate in the United States was only 3.3%. My point is that if, and at the rate that we're not going to be able to find a solution on the health issue anytime in the near future, we're probably likely to see a further extrapolation of this chart. Now, we can extrapolate this in the next few months. It's probably going to look like the unemployment rate is going to shoot up to about 25 to 30% in the next few months. God forbid, okay? Now, the, one, the point that I want to highlight is that this unemployment rate is likely to go up to 25 to 30% only in a matter of months from 3.3% in February of 2020 in contrast to the Great Depression during the 30s where and when the unemployment rate shot up to about 24%, but it took three years for the unemployment rate to go up from single digit to 24% during the 30s, during the Great Depression in the 30s, okay? That, I think, is a sign of times. And again, I make the point that I was making earlier in that, yes, it is the nature of what is happening in the United States, but given the fact that most of the liquidity in the world actually revolves around the United States economy, it has tremendous implications on the rest of the global economy by way of not only the interconnectivity of money moving from one place to another, but also the connectivity of the supply chain. Okay, if we go to the next page, this is an illustration of how the unemployment rate, uh, rate crept up 
over a three-year period from 1929 to 1932, and how the GDP growth actually crept down, and how inflation actually crept up, okay? So we are basically looking at a declination of GDP growth. We're looking at an inclination of inflation. Sorry, a declination of inflation and an increase of or an inclination of unemployment rate. Okay. There are some theories around the world by some economists about the possibility of the world's you know, the world economy going through some sort of a stack inflation, okay? And, and I think you could argue that, you know, that could be right by way of the staggering of or the lagging of the effects of the coronavirus on different geographies, as, as illustrated in the earlier chart. It would have affected China, then it would affect uh, Europe and the U.S. thereafter, and it would affect the developing economies at the later stage. Uh, because of that, uh, we're, we're likely to see a staggering, uh, you know, of the aggregate demand in different geographies of the world. And you could also see possibly, uh, you know, a negative uh, supply shocks uh, happening in different parts of the world at different times, uh, which could inflate price by way of the negative supply shock that's happening within you know, uh, different geographies, you're, you're likely to see a staggering of uh, inflationary uh, pressures uh, coming from different geographies. Okay, now this is an illustration of uh, the extent to which uh, government budgets are with respect to, you know, their country's GDPs. If we take a look at the United States, uh, the APBN or the government budget or the fiscal space uh, is around 36% of the GDP, okay? That basically speaks of the proactive uh, degree or nature uh, that the government plays within the economy uh, compared to South Korea, which is at about 27% of the GDP, compared to Singapore, which is at about 29% of the GDP, uh, compared to Malaysia, uh, which is at about 18% of the GDP, compared to Indonesia, which is at about 17%. So Indonesia's APBN or Indonesia's fiscal space or Indonesia's government budget uh, compares less uh, on a re relative basis you know, with, with the GDP vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the other countries. So the point I'm trying to make from this slide is that in the context of COVID-19 affecting a good chunk of the economy, uh, let's assume that the degree to which that COVID-19, uh, you know, affects any country's GDP by the same amount on a relative uh, basis, it only underlines the point that the Indonesian government is going to have to be even much more proactive in covering for that part, if not those parts of the economy that are actually suffering or collapsing or declining as compared to other countries where they already have a more proactive role being played by the government by way of their having a much larger fiscal space vis-a-vis -vis their GDPs respectively. Okay. This chart uh, I think has been shown, you know, uh, in many instances by many people. Uh, it, it illustrates uh, the degree of revision uh, of you know economic growth rates in various countries i'm i'm of the view that uh, this is still a possibility if we were to see some sort of a recovery in the near foreseeable future uh, but i'm also of the view that there is another possibility of this actually becoming uh, even worse uh, for all the countries that are mentioned uh, you know on this chart uh, given the fact that we're seeing differential steps that are being taken by different governments or economies uh, or countries. Uh, so I, I think at the rate that, you know, governments around the world are not behaving in a concerted manner, in a coordinated manner in tackling the issue, number one, and at the rate that each government is actually not being as proactive 
uh, with respect to the economy as we would see uh, with other you know, governments, uh, we are probably likely to see uh, a different uh, outcome uh, of, of this revision of the economic growth rates of various countries. Uh, this is just a caution. This is not uh, a foresight. So the next page, we're, we're seeing re-ratings, okay, which are taking place with respect to instruments uh, that are, you know, uh, characterized by different uh, sectors or, or, or behaviors. Uh, the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that uh, as, as we're seeing re-ratings of companies and even sovereignties, uh, that's going to affect the cost of capital. And we're, we're not seeing any re-rating upward. We're only seeing re-rating downward, okay? At the rate that most companies around the world or most countries around the world, by way of the COVID-19 development, are likely to be re-rated downward, that's only gonna affect cost of capital in an adverse manner. Unless the re-rating is upward, then the cost of capital is gonna come down, okay? Now, I've, I've said before that money is chasing quality right now. Money is shunning and leaving and departing from the less quality instruments or countries. And we're likely to see further re-ratings of corporations and sovereignties. So expect cost of capital to go up. For most people around the world, for most com companies around the world, for most uh, you know, economies around the world. Okay. What could be a possible solution? I mean, I think many people, you know, have, you know, smart ideas about what could be a possible solution. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I want to just talk about one idea that I've been trying to basically advocate to some people around me. Uh, if we could go to the next page. Okay. This chart basically tells me and tells you that, you know, there's about 129 people that are working in Indonesia. This is the officially registered number of people that are working in Indonesia, 129 people. Now, uh, we, we, can, we can splice it even further. We go to the next page. Okay, this, this is an important chart. Okay, this, this came from BPS, the, this, uh, the National Statistical Agency. It, it basically tells us that the payroll related to the 129 million people that are working across the country. And this is without any consideration of the informal sectors that may involve, I don't know, a good few millions probably, uh, but just sticking to the officially registered workforce of 129, uh, 29 million people, the amount of payroll that needs to be paid to every one of the, these 129 million people is about 324 trillion rupiah on a monthly basis, okay? Now, if you multiply that by 12 or 13, inclusive of THR, then we're looking at more than 4,000 trillion rupiah, okay? 4,000 trillion rupiah makes up about 25% of Indonesia's GDP of 16,000 trillions. Okay, and this is just for every one of the 129 million people or workers in the country to be able to get a paycheck so that they could go home and feed their spouses, children, mates, drivers, or what have you, and put food on the table, okay, and hopefully be able to pay for electricity, and hopefully be able to pay for water, and hopefully be able to pay for, you know, some sort of a lifestyle, but I can tell you that I think it's safe to assume a good chunk of this 324 trillion rupees has been impaired by way of the slowdown. And I think you have to put this in the context of how the PSBB or the physical distancing has affected economic activities in an adverse manner. I think what's fundamental about everything that we're going through right now is that there is a concern within every individual. There is even fear within every individual to undertake mobility, 
or to also undertake activity. And at the rate that we are immobile and at the rate that we are inactive, there is likely to be lower economic activity because we're shifting from this physical communal to non-physical and virtual and non-communal, right? So the ability to pay the payroll has got to come down because there is no you know, commensurate economic activities. There is no commensurate mobility. There is no commensurate activity. And I think the hardest hit sectors, which are basically reflected on this chart, if you take a look at the industry pengolahan and industry pengeceran, right? They themselves amount to about Perdagangan besar dan eceran, reparasi dan perawatan mobil, and industri pengolahan, those are the hardest hit. Okay, each one of these two items amounts to about 50 trillions. Okay, just the two of them amount to about 100 trillions. Okay, now if we want to put this in the context of maintaining or sustaining social stability, so that people could actually be able to buy food and drinks and feed their families, we've got to make sure that these workers, these employees are going to be able to get supported. I don't think they're likely to be able to be supported by their employers in the normal way that they have been supported because their employer cannot undertake any economic activity because their employees cannot undertake economic activities. The, the factories are closed down because of physical distancing. And anything you can you can you can think about the barber that's been cutting hair. He or she is not being able to cut any hair. You can think about the therapist. You can think about the pedicurist. You can think about the manicurist. You can think about the ojek drivers that are used to driving six seven rides a day. And right now there is a lot fewer, a lot smaller number of people that are actually riding the motorcycles, if not cars. So. How do you expect these people to actually get paid like they used to in the past? So I think, I think what, what I'm trying to illustrate or highlight here is that if there's any actor of the economic equation that could and has the capacity to play a more proactive role, it's not the employees. It's actually the government. Okay? It's probably to some extent the large corporations and the mid-sized corporations but I don't think they're going to have as much capacity as the government would in this case. So it's a staggering amount, more than 4,000 trillion rupees that's going to be needed to keep every one of these 129 million people afloat for one year. It's a staggering amount already for you know, just a portion of the 129 people to be kept afloat just for a month amounting to more than 100 trillion rupees out of the 324 trillion rupees a month. It's a, a more staggering amount, you know, to keep just these, you know, portions of the 129 people afloat for more than a month. You know, if, if we want to think about how long this COVID-19 is going to last, I would guess um, it's not going to disappear by next week, but it's probably likely to disappear only after a few months from today. So, Assuming we're probably going to be, you know, out the door, you know, after six months from today, we're going to have to try to figure out how we're going to actually be able to keep these people uh, of the 129 million people afloat in the next, you know, few months, call it six months. So I, I think this is what I'm driving at, you know, or I've been, you know, trying to drive at uh, so that, you know, we can collectively try to come up with a solution. Okay, next page. This is an idea that I've been socializing, discussing with some people uh, on, on the basis of the following. I think we've got to be cognizant of the fact that there are limitations. Uh, there are four limitations. Number one, uh, the limitation uh, is uh, relevant to our very own fiscal space, okay? We know that our tax collection last year was less than target, okay? Our government budget hovers uh, around 2,000 trillions. That's about $13 billion. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. 2,000. That's about $130 billion. Okay. And we were not able to collect 
everything that we were supposed to collect in tax revenues last year. And given how the business environment or the economic environment, you know, has fared in the last few months, uh, I think it is safe to assume that the, the tax collectability is, is not going to be uh, any more robust than whatever we saw uh, in 2019. So uh, we are basically limited from a fiscal standpoint, okay? And, and the second limitation is also with respect to the monetary uh, policy. We have seen a systematic declination of interest rates in the last few years. However, as, as I mentioned you know, before, we've only seen uh, credit growth of only 6% last year, a little over 6%. Okay, and 6% credit growth, uh, you know, is, is, in my view, is not deemed as being robust enough to basically push for an economy to actually, you know, move in, in, in a robust manner. Uh, I think a double digit uh, credit growth uh, on a yearly basis is, is what may be needed to basically see or contemplate a more robust uh, lending environment. So right there, I think it reflects, it reflects upon the lack of liquidity within the domestic market, but also it reflects upon uh, the, uh, you know, semi not so robust, uh, you, know, invest, uh, you know, investment climate or economic environment uh, as, as, as a whole. So I, I, I don't foresee a lot of room for anybody to basically attain a lot of liquidity from the domestic markets by way of what I've been saying, you know, in the last couple of minutes. The third limitation is with respect to the multilateral agencies. We are uh, cognizant of the fact that, you know, multilateral agencies such as the World Bank and the IMF, even the IMF, they've got, I think, uh, an allocation of about a trillion dollars uh, to basically provide support to anybody that needs support. Uh, but we're talking about the trillion dollars that's possibly going to be allocated for so many countries that are going to line up for support. So I don't, I don't foresee a scenario where Indonesia is going to be at the forefront of the line or, or of the queue. I don't, see if, I don't foresee a scenario where, you know, Indonesia is also going to be able to get a good chunk of, of the trillion dollars, uh, you know, that's going to be allocated for, you know, there's about 216 countries around the world. So I think that's the reality that we have to basically be sensitive to, uh, not to mention uh, some possible political sensitivity, given the fact that you know we 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 were supported by the IMF, you know, at the peak of the Asian financial crisis in the late '90s, and and we went through you know a, a pretty difficult journey uh, while we were being supported uh, by the IMF to the point where we actually managed to pay off uh, all our obligations to the IMS. So the first limitation was the fiscal space limitation. The second is the monetary limitation, monetary policy limitation. The third is the multilateral, uh, you know, limitation. And, and the fourth, uh, I think the limitation is the reality that's actually confronting us in that, you know, the amount that's going to be needed to, to, conf to, to combat uh, the COVID-19 uh, development is, I think, gigantic, gigantic. Okay. Now, going back to the earlier illustration of the payroll amount that's needed for 129 million people on a monthly basis, that's already about 324 trillions. And just going by the two sectors that would have been badly hit, uh, hit uh, uh, you know, the industry pangalahan or the process, processing industry and also the, the automotive industry, we're looking at about 100 trillion rupees that's already been impaired out of the 324 trillions. So if we want to just keep two sectors afloat, we're looking at about, you know, seeking support for at least or around 100 trillion a month, okay? Now, if we want to think about supporting these people, these millions of people, you know, uh, for six months, then you're looking at multiplying 100 trillions uh, by six. And even that, you know, that, that, uh, that is already 600 trillion rupees which is uh, unfortunately greater than the 405 uh, trillion rupees uh, that would have been announced by the government as a stimulus package. Now, I think first and foremost is to actually be able to quantify 
the degree of this as a health issue, okay? And, and I've shared in the past uh, lectures uh, that, you know, Indonesia has no more than 800,000 beds in hospitals, okay? And I think we have to consider the worst case scenario in that uh, I think, you know, a, a greater number than whatever has been announced could be infected in the future. God forbid, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope we're all wrong. But I think in planning forward, we've got to be able to basically prepare for the worst case scenario. And I do believe that the amount that's going to be needed to provide uh, preventive measures, remedial measures for the health and medical issues that are enveloping the people around Indonesia is going to amount to a lot more than the 75 trillion that would have been allocated as part of the 405 trillion groups that was announced a couple of weeks ago. So I'm, I'm looking at, you know, around three to 400 trillion rupiah that's going to be needed just for the healthcare, making sure that we're going to be able to test, you know, a lot more than 113 million, uh, 113 people on a 1 million basis. We're going to have to do testing like the South Koreans or like, the, 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 the Malaysians, like the, the Americans, like the Chinese are, we're going to have to test 20 to 30 to 40,000 a day to figure out where exactly the zip codes are, where the transmission is happening in a bigger way than others. Unless we do that, we have no idea. I think it's a black box. Okay. Once we find out the degree to which, you know, people would have been affected or infected, uh, then we can figure out where to house them, where to accommodate them in, in the hospital beds. Okay, we're, we're going to have to figure out a way to increase the number of beds in hospitals. We've, we've seen some very, very encouraging signs being done by the government in terms of converting Wisma Atlet into hospital capability. But I think we're going to have to do more than that. We're going to have to buy ventilators. We're going to have to buy masks. We're going to have to you know, buy beds. We're going to have to also train the nurses and the doctors. I think it amounts to a lot more than 75 trillion groups. Uh, so that, that's first and foremost. The second is basically the, 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 the payroll for those that are and will continue to be affected uh, in the next six months. And that amounts to you know, 600 trillions. So right there, just for the healthcare uh, you know, uh, enhancement, and for the sustenance of the millions of people, people that need to be getting payroll on a continuous basis, we're looking at a thousand trillion rupees, okay, which is a lot more than the 405 trillions. Then beyond that, you got to start thinking about the OEM times, you know, think about those barbers, think about those, uh, you know, OJEC drivers, think about those uh, Wartok owners who can't sell their, you know, fried chicken, who can't sell, you know, the vendors, who can't sell their, you know, baju, sarung, and, and all that good stuff. Uh, they got nobody to sell to because nobody's moving, nobody's traveling, nobody's mobile. Uh, and, and, and I think they have to be uh, supported in some fashion. And, and, and the way I look at it is, you know, the total number of UMKMs or small, medium entrepreneurs is about 62 million in the country. That's the official figure. So, uh, you know, given that, you know, millions of those 62 million people are, are likely to have been and continue to be impaired, uh, they need to be able to feed their families, okay? And, and I think 300 uh, trillion is, is the figure. The last category is basically helping out the industries, uh, helping out the industries that are labor intensive. You can define la labor intensive, it, uh, you know, intensiveness, you know, in the context of anybody's employing more than 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people. But I can tell you there is a lot of factories out there that are closed down because the, the, the employees don't want to, to come in or the employers don't want them to come in because of government decrees or some, some self-imposition upon themselves. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I can only come up to a figure that's a lot larger than the 405 trillion. And, and this, uh, this, uh, you know, this set of things you know, adds up to 1,600 trillions. And that, that is roughly 10% you know, uh, of the GDP. And that is just for purposes of basically keeping you know, millions of people afloat uh, in the next six months.
Now, imagine the scenario where, you know, this pandemic uh, continues beyond a six-month period, God forbid. But if it does, uh, I, I think we're looking at, you know, more dire possibilities. So, in sum, once we've quantified this amount, how do we get this? How do we get this amount? Okay, I think this is the tricky part. Given that there is a fiscal limitation, okay, I've, I've already discussed, you know, the degree to which we can actually tap into the international markets for liquidity. I've already discussed, you know, the limitations or the limits uh, with, uh, with respect to the international markets for borrowing. I've already discussed, you know, the monetary space limitation by way of the unrobust or semi-robust uh, credit lending activities in the past. Uh, I, I, I could only come up with uh, the idea of uh, quantitative easing, which has been done by a number of countries. And quantitative easing has been done by, you know, economies like U.S., the UK, ECB, Japan, and China. And if, if, if you take a look at the amount that has been quantitatively eased by these economies, uh, it's about $22 trillion cumulatively ever since 2008, ever since the, you know, the breakout of the Lehman Brothers uh, crisis. Uh, and and, and it, is, it is a step that has been taken by some developed economies in view of combating uh, you know, the ongoing financial crisis. But I think the big difference between 2008 and today is that, you know, in 2008, there was no health crisis, okay? And, and the health component of the crisis, I think, adds uh, a lot more mystery to the resolution or how we're going to have to come up with a resolution to the economic crisis. Uh, and, and quantitative easing is basically the exercise of, you know, issuing new money. And, and this could be in the form of basically the central banks, uh, you know, uh, quantitatively easing uh, or monetizing the fiscal requirements, uh, meaning, you know, the Ministry of Finance would issue in a primary market uh, bonds that would be subscribed to by the central bank uh, in an exclusive or semi-exclusive manner. Um, and, and this, I think you can, you can look at the pros and cons of quantitative easing. I can, I can. Uh, I can unequivocally underline uh, that, you know, this is way against, uh, you know, the ideology that was taught to people like me in schools. But given the limitations of, of our ability to seek liquidity from the international markets and the domestic markets, uh, it, it seems to be, you know, the only alternative of um, making or getting money by way of creating money. And in, in, in the act of creating this money, we can basically dwell into, uh, you know, the pros and cons of, of the argument. Uh, the cons, let me start, uh, would include, uh, you know, the, the money actually not trickling down to the right people that need it, okay? We have actually seen this uh, happening in some of the developed economies that have done quantitative easing, uh, particularly the United States, okay? The United States has done so much quantitative easing in the last 12 years, uh, I would argue, people would argue that uh, a lot of that money that was basically liquefied uh, only went to the elites within Wall Street and, and the corporations. Uh, it did not go to the main street, uh, and, and as a result of which, I think we saw the turnout uh, in the political equation in 2016, where a lot of people were actually grumbling, you know, uh, about how the policies that were enacted in 2008 did not, uh, you know, end up in trickling the money down to the people that were working in factories in Michigan, in, you know, a number of uh, states in, in, in the Midwest. Uh, and that, I think, is, is one highlight of, of the negatives of uh, quantitative easing. The second uh, is, is with respect to, you know, a potential moral hazard. Uh, moral hazard in the execution of the quantitative easing, which uh, involves, you know, potentially uh, people that are in charge of uh, you know, streaming or showering, uh, showering the, the liquidity to the right people, but not showering to the right people. 
And, and this has happened in the past, uh, you know, in many countries. Uh, I don't have to highlight which countries, you know, have, have uh, you know, been involved in stuff like that. The third risk is, is the risk of inflation, okay? Uh, to the extent that the, the quantitative easing or the liquefaction of money into the economy is done at a pace faster than needed, uh, it runs the risk of inflating prices. It runs the risk of inflating uh, demand uh, for things that are beyond uh, the, the required demand. Uh, I.e., if you need, you know, a hundred groups to buy the tomatoes, uh, and, and if you're actually given a hundred and five groups, uh, you're, you're likely to buy more tomatoes than you actually need uh, for your own day-to-day -day meals. And that's going to cause the price of tomatoes to go up. So uh, the first is the risk of uh, not trickling down to the right people. Uh, number two is the moral hazard in a broader sense. Uh, number three is inflationary pressure. And, and the last uh, risk uh, is, is that with respect to potential capital flight. Uh, to the extent that, you know, this liquefaction of the eco economy actually goes to, let's say, again, the wrong people, and they may end up taking that money because they don't need it for the day-to-day -day consumption. They may end up taking that money to the money changer and exchange that for US dollars and that's gonna cause a spike uh, in the exchange rate uh, and that's gonna depreciate uh, the rupiah. So that is basically uh, the set of risks related uh, to you know, doing a quantitative easing. Now, the pros are, are not that many. Uh, the, the pros uh, include, number one, you're actually gonna have the liquidity to support uh, the very people that are actually gonna need uh, you know, the liquidity, uh, particularly those millions of people that are in the workforce that don't uh, get paid because their employers don't have money and the factories are closed down. And, and those entrepreneurs or small, medium entrepreneurs that would have been, uh, you know, uh, selling fried chicken, cutting hair, uh, manicuring, pedicuring people, but they don't have income and they've got to be supported. Otherwise, you know, they could do the wrong things within the society uh, or the community. Uh, so the, the, the second uh, benefit is that uh, it, it, it helps with respect to the stabilization uh, of the economy, uh, you know, and uh, as a whole, uh, and, and it could actually tail into the potential or prospect of, of reindustrializing Indonesia, right? Uh, we have seen an episode in a big way where many countries around the world are so dependent on, you know, a select few countries being the major, uh, the major factories of the world. Okay. You could, you could take a look at the data points on, you know, 80% of the stuff that's sold off at Walmart is made in China. 90% of the stuff that's sold off Amazon, Tokopedia, Bukalapak, and all that good stuff is basically made in China, okay? And this, I think, is a phenomenon that would have been the result of, you know, the globalization that started, you know, 20 to 30 years ago. Ever since China entered the WTO in 2001, China has become the most major factory of the world which is really great, but we have seen how many economies and billions of people around the world have been affected by a negative disruption to the supply chain, okay? And, and, and I call that a negative supply shock. And, and I think this over-dependence on one or two countries for supply side purposes, I think has told us in the context of the COVID-19 that I think there may need to be a rejigging of the contour of supply chain. Uh, and this is not against globalization, but I, 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 can, I can see or I can foresee governments and economies around the world, I think weighing in to uh, a possibility of rebalancing or recalibrating supply chains. 
so that you know if we were to enter into another pandemic uh god forbid i hope it's not as big as this one but you know this is not an impossibility as bill gates had you know already pontificated five years ago uh and and in the event that we are actually being confronted again in the future by a similar if not worse pandemic uh, i think we're going to be more secure from a broader more diversified more diversified supply side standpoint so in in some uh the amount that's going to be needed to keep the economy afloat just by way of keeping the millions of people afloat so that they get money so that they could continue the lifestyle that they've been embracing so far essentially amounts to at least 1600 trillions and i i want to just basically underline the possibility that it could be less only and only if and only if the pandemic is going to get resolved sooner rather than later but i also want to highlight the other possibility that the amount could be even more in the event that the pandemic is not going to be resolved sooner rather than later now i want to just highlight how the us government has done it okay they they call it in financial terms or in capital markets terms all in the fed has gone all in what they have done is that they have been buying the treasury bills they have been buying the treasury notes they have been buying the corporation bonds they have been buying the municipal bonds that are issued by state and local governments they have also entered into swap arrangements with various central banks around the country including the central bank of indonesia or bank indonesia amounting to about 60 billion dollars okay the reason for this is that i think the fed and the us government are sensitive to the possibility that you know some other countries may not have dollar liquidity and and to the extent that there is no not enough dollar liquidity in you know each one of these respective economies uh, it could have an adverse effect on the exchange rate of that particular economy the fact that you know there is an agreement to undertake a 60 billion dollar swap between the fed and bank indonesia i i think it's a beautiful thing in that it it provides comfort to the people uh, within the economy that there's actually going to be enough dollar liquidity uh so that you know uh you know people are not going to rush off you know basically buying dollars because there's actually enough uh you know dollar liquidity so that that i think is is uh, the extra thing that the fed has done you know uh, as a consequence of their doing quantitative easing now people have asked me in the past uh, as to whether or not the fed is likely to do more quantitative easing uh, i would bet uh, i they are going to do more uh, i would also bet that the the us government is also going to augment uh, their fiscal stimulus uh, given you know many of the uncertainties that are still enveloping you know on the people uh, in in the united states and and i'm not suggesting that we should copycat uh, everything that the united states government is doing everything that the chinese government is doing everything that the japanese the south korean and singaporean governments are doing but i'm only suggesting those as as references uh so that we could have you know a much more realistic of what we're dealing with and a much more realistic view of what we got to do let me pause and start taking questions okay so hello pagita i'm risky i'm from schneider electric and i believe we met up a couple of weeks ago um so first of all thank you very much for the explanation uh, it's a uh, it's the fact is very concerning more than i thought or we thought actually and the second of all the way i see it i don't know based on the history we see that after the crisis there there always be you know opportunity like for example indonesia has been colonized by Neder netherlands but because of that we can uh, we can become a big country like this because if that's not happening we will be a several country not like a country as this big so third part is the questions um because of this crisis what what do you think the major change that will occur on how we do things globally 
especially after maybe the case fully resolved, like what you say maybe after the key to 2021 based on your chart. So what, what, what will be the major change on how we do things differently globally because it hits everyone in the country very hard. So thank you for the opportunity. I think you're, like, you're likely to see uh, shifts in paradigms. Uh, at the very least within the more developed economies by way of what's happening, okay? And, and, and to be more uh, tangible about this, uh, you know, the United States, uh, by way of NAFTA, okay, they have relocated, you know, manufacturing capabilities to Mexico and Canada. And to some extent, you know, Asia, yeah, mm. some countries call it China, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Indonesia. Okay, that would have taken place in the 90s. And uh, more strongly, or more in a more pronounced manner, since 2001, when China joined the WTO, okay, the United States, they have relocated even more manufacturing capabilities to China, to the point where now most of the goods and services that are being sold off, as I said earlier, you know, at Amazon or at Walmart. And, and the reason why I highlight Walmart is that Walmart is a store that's within five minutes yeah, for, for anybody in any zip code in, 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 in the United States. So it is the most geographically, geographically distributed uh, you know, uh, uh, point of sale for anything that you need on a daily basis. 80% of the stuff that's sold off at Walmart is made in China, okay? Now you can imagine how the Americans are feeling right now because there's been some disruption, right, of supply through the Walmarts of the world, through the Amazons of the world. You may be able to get your stuff from, from Amazon, but I can guarantee you, and I've tried it, you know, there's a delay. You know, you could have gotten the stuff in a day or two, but you may have to wait longer because of that supply shop in a negative way. and 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 you know, more importantly, the pharmaceutical products that used to be made in the US, call it penicillin, call it aspirin, okay? They also have been relocated to places like China. So you can imagine if you're in a hospital, you need penicillin, you need aspirin, to the extent that there is a negative supply shop involving China and the other countries that may have been relocated to by the US for pharmaceutical you know, production purposes, uh, there is there is a concern now, you know, within uh, mm -hmm. you know America or within the United States. So right now, there's a lot of conversations uh, amongst you know policymakers in the U.S. and also also Western European countries mm -hmm. about reshoring. Okay, they're thinking about reshoring what they have offshored mm -hmm. in the past. Okay, sure. so I think you're likely to see this at least from a policy narrative standpoint. Okay, whether or not it's going to translate to an actualization, I don't know. Okay, mm. because it, it depends on the multilateral conversations. It doesn't just depend on the conversation within each country. Yeah. But, but I can tell you, I think there's enough anxiety, if not concern, within the Western European countries and also the United States about how they're not going to be able to or how they have not been able to get masks on a timely basis, how they have not been able to get ventilators on a timely basis. You know, 3M, which is one of the largest producers of masks, you know, is, a, is an American company, but their largest factory is actually based in Shanghai. And they were not able to get the 3M masks in time, you know, for the Americans as the pandemic was starting to envelope in a big way, you know, the New Yorks uh, of the world and, and the other states in the United States. So I, I think within logic, you're likely to see more and more conversations uh, basically with respect to reshoring manufacturing capabilities. Now, uh, do I also mean that countries or economies like Indonesia is going to follow suit? Possibly, because mm -hmm. we are also vulnerable to this negative supply shock, right? Uh, yeah. We have not been able to get enough ventilators in many hospitals around the country, much less, you know, masks. You know, the last time I checked on Tokopedia or some of the marketplaces, it, it costs a lot more expensively you know, to get a mask than it would have been two, three months ago. So mm. right there, uh, we are experiencing a shock, which I think, or I foresee, uh, could have implications on policy narratives going forward. Now, 
I, I, I just want to see that more as a blessing as opposed to a curse, because if yeah. it is deemed as something that we've got to take a view on, then I think we could take it, you know, we could, we could take one step further in terms of further industrializing Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think, you know, this could be an opportunity for economies like Indonesia to actually further industrialize or reindustrialize. And that's going to create a lot more jobs for yeah. the country, which is good. And, and I don't mean it in a nationalistic sense or a patriotic sense. I, I mean it, I think, for the purpose of sustaining social stability so that everybody is going to have you know, exposure to a much broadly, much more broadly diversified, much broadly you know, diversified supply chain. Uh, good morning, Pa Gita and everyone. Um, I would like to ask about the currency, uh, the US dollar currency uh, that uh, Pa Gita mentioned earlier that would be uh, probably um, uh, distributed by the IMF to help uh, other nations um, regarding the uh, uh, some loans. Um, I I've read some uh, some sources that um, uh, currently IMF is suggesting to uh, use the the Chinese uh, currency yuan to be uh, the the other main currency for um, global reserve. Um, right. What do you okay. think about that, Pak Gita? And do you think um, it will um, change the the I don't know the global uh, game of uh, financing or um, yeah? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. it. I okay. Think. All right. Look, I I, I the, the 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 Chinese renminbi was included in the special drawing rights uh, within the IMF. Uh, it took place in 2015. So it took place five years ago, okay? And this was a recognition for the presence or the, the increased presence of China in, in the global economy, okay? Uh, before that, China was not part of the special drawing rights. Uh, as, as China has attempted to basically, uh, you know, show its presence in the global economy, which it has, uh, and, and I think the, the, the byproduct of that was to basically ensure, you know, increased popularity of the renminbi, okay? But the fact, as of today, remains in that the renminbi only represents around 2% of the, uh, you know, cross-border uh, SWIFT uh, transactions, okay? The, the cross-border SWIFT uh, transactions are still dominated by the U.S. dollar. Okay, the U.S. dollar occupies about 45% of the international day-to-day cross-border SWIFT transactions, whereas the euro represents, I think, around 35%, and, and the rest are occupied uh, by, uh, you know, uh, the, the yen, the Swiss franc, the pound, and at, you know, at, at the tail end is the renminbi. So that, I think, reflects upon the degree to which the renminbi uh, seems to have difficulty in popularizing its current currency for, for the purpose of international wisdom. Uh, does it have a chance of going up to a much higher number uh, than 2% of the global cross-border uh, you know, SWIFT transactions? Uh, yes, it does, because China's economy right now represents about 17% of the global economy. Uh, you know, 12 to 15 years ago, China's economy was only 4 to 5%. Uh, of the global economy. So at, at any rate, as this number, you know, 17% of the global economy goes up to 20, 25%, 30% of the global economy, I think it's only natural that Remimbi is going to occupy a bigger parking space uh, within not only the special drawing rights, but also within the swift cross-border transactions of the world. So this, I think, is, is an interesting uh, part, uh, which, which we're going to have to watch you know, in the coming years. Uh, and, and I foresee, I think, more and more financing that's going to be done in Romimbi uh, by, by the Chinese government to, you know, their multilateral partners. Uh, but in terms of Romimbi being part of the currencies that's going to be used by the IMF for financing or supporting, 
you know, its member countries. Uh, I, I don't see that happening yet. And I don't see, you know, the IMF, uh, again, uh, as a multilateral agency uh, being, uh, you know, there to support Indonesia in a big way uh, for liquidity support purposes uh, on, 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 on the accounts that I've mentioned before. Number one, the limitation because of the fact that so many countries are queuing up for support. Uh, mm -hmm. And number two, uh, as to whether or not, you know, it is the right political uh, choice to make, uh, given what we went through uh, ever since 1998. But that's that's beyond this class. Uh, good morning, everyone. Pa Gita uh, and uh, the others. Uh, I'm Andres Cristianto from PT Pembangunan Jaya Ancol. Uh, good morning, Pa. Uh, since I'm from uh, tourism sector, uh, yeah, I'm feeling that the tourism sector was hit tremendously because. Uh, we are expecting the crowd to fulfill uh, our place uh, that to generate our revenue, of course. And, uh, you know, it's a contribution of tourism sector is about 5.6% in 2019. And, uh, but it's not our focus to, uh, for our question. My, my question is, uh, since we are aware we are uh, facing uncertainty when it, uh, when it will be over, uh, focus next at uh, economic to you know umkm because uh, some say that uh, the business owner say that we could only survive during this situation up to june okay we're talking about uh, our strengths of our case so what would you think about that pa? would you, uh, what would you say to the, the to the authorities to the policy maker or to the business owner because uh, June uh, will be coming up about well, two months uh, ahead and you know uh, our loss in uh, our, our loss in our profit will be accumulated month by month and it's a hard choice because we should uh, we should keep uh, paying the payroll to our employees mm -hmm. and, but uh, but if it uh, doesn't uh, occurred uh, will increase the un unemployment rate. Okay, that's yeah. our question. But thank you. Okay, uh, look, I I can tell you the the global travel industry uh, has and is and will be hit by about forty to fifty percent. Okay, this year alone. Okay, and and the global travel industry amounts to about nine trillion dollars per year. The global GDP is about $85 trillion, right? So the travel industry, including what you're doing, you know, the theme parks of the world, the cruise lines of the world, the airports of the world, the seaports of the world, the trains of the world, the airliners of the world, the, the taxis of the world, the FNBs of the world, the hospitalities of the world, uh, they amount to about $9 trillion, okay? That's about a little over 10% of the GDP. With a correction of 40 to 50 percent, we're looking at about 4.5 trillion dollars worth of correction. Okay, right. so 4.5 trillion dollars is about five percent of the global GDP. Okay, so right there, you know, you're going to see a contraction of the global GDP by minus first five percent. Okay. Okay, because nobody goes to the restaurants right now. Nobody goes to the hotel. Uh, in Indonesia alone, uh, more than 2,000 hotels have closed, okay? Uh, I, I happen to be quite familiar with this sector. Most uh, hotels that have closed down uh, temporarily, not permanently, uh, are in West Java and in Bali, okay? There are also many in Sumatra. There are also many in other parts of Java and Kalimantan, Maluku, Sulawesi, and all that good stuff. But uh, that has been basically impaired, Okay, not only do they not have the ability to pay payroll because there is no customers coming in, mm -hmm. but they do not have any ability to even pay for utilities, okay, mm -hmm. including yeah. electricity, including water, yeah, fixed much cost, less, much yeah. less, much less what they have to pay to the bank because when mm -hmm. they built the construction, you know, they had to borrow from the bank, okay? Mm -hmm. 
because mm-hmm. the, 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 the model that was set up with the bank was on the basis that they would get customers, they would get revenues, and from the revenues, they would be able to you know, deduct with expenses, with whatever you know, deduction, then they can come up with something that they could pay to the bank, right? So yeah. it is happening with more than 2,000 hotels in the country, okay? Now, with the restaurants, it's not good either, okay? And, and, and there is a study that basically says that about 30 to 40% of restaurant owners around the world, mm-hmm. they're not likely to be able to get up again, okay? They are permanently oh. impaired, okay? Okay. We're talking about the closure of more than 40% of the restaurants around the world, or yes. l- l- let's call it most countries. But a good mm-hmm. chunk of that is not going to be able to get up again permanently because they've been completely amputated. Okay. If let's say yeah. the recovery of COVID-19 takes place six months from today, the restaurant mm-hmm. owner, you know, just doesn't have any wherewithal to basically yeah. go to the bank and borrow because the bank would, would, would not regard him as Have a trust. worthy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. much less to be able to, uh, you know, get the, 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 the ingredients to cook, much less to mm. recruit, you know, people to actually work again as waiters and waitresses and all that. So it, it, is, it is a pretty dark picture of what could happen within, you know, your space, unfortunately. So yeah. there is a significant impairment of the value proposition within the travel industry. You know, airports, uh, they're technically insolvent. Okay, seaports, they're technically insolvent uh, because they are running at, you know, maybe five to 10% of their normalized scenarios, okay, yeah. uh, in, in the past, uh, as of today. So uh, on, on the basis that you're running at about five to 10% of what you should have been doing, uh, you're technically insolvent because, you know, with the banks, uh, you know, most, most of these guys, they borrow from the bank. There's, there's a clause that says that if you run at X percent lower than what has to be done, uh, you're technically insolvent. That's even before paying principal and interest, you know, to the banks. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have not even addressed the need for basically supporting the large industries, the strategic industries, uh, so that they could actually sustain operationally. I've only yeah. addressed the extent to which we need to support the millions of people that basically just need to get salary so that they could feed their families, number one, yeah. and mm. the healthcare capacity that needs to be augmented, and okay, okay. the small, medium entrepreneurs that need to be supported because they can't sell the fried chicken. Yeah. And the, the last of all is basically just the uh, the you know some of the you know labor intensive uh, industries but these are not the large you know and strategic industries that are pertinent to our economic you know development going forward now if you take a look at the stimulus package in the US out of the 2.2 trillion dollars they've allocated about 600 billion dollars for large corporations okay yeah. I, I was very cautious about not not using that sort of an example in our stimulus or proposed stimulus package because anytime Agreed. you talk about a stimulus package for supporting the large ones, you know, it smells funny. It smells moral hazard. It yeah. smells, you know, we got to take care of the little people first. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, I like the idea of you say that we need um, more reindustrializations of Indonesia. For example, as you said, the example of US, they, <clears throat> or your state is reshoring um, because I already concerned about that so many of we are depend so much on China for productions even though for the products that actually technologically is not that complicated we can produce here but um, what do you think Indonesia need to do to be able to take back some industry to Indonesia and especially with the trade agreement, I think it will not be easy for us to just <clears throat> take back the industry. So what, what, what move that the government has to do so we can have the industry back to Indonesia? So like you said, there is some, maybe some medical equipment that is not so complicated like the face mask. We should be able to produce ourselves. Um, even in the 
fashions or uh, clothes, everything. We still buy a lot from China. So, so what is your uh, idea of how to do this? Thank you. Well, I, I, I think those are, those are basic things that Indonesia should be capable of producing. Right. I, I would even take it further. I would even take it to the point of manufacturing handphones. Okay, uh, we we buy and sell about a hundred million handphones on a yearly basis. Right, most of that actually comes from China. Right, there's some assembly capabilities in Indonesia that make uh, that assemble handphones. Uh, you know, components that actually mostly come from China. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why, you know, graduates of, you know, SMKs and even other, you know, uh, higher education domain not being able to basically produce uh, basic things. And, and that's, I think, the whole idea of moving up the value chain, right? Uh, I think it's apt and timely for Indonesia to move up the value chain. And, and this is not, again, a nationalistic fervor. But, but I think it's being sensitive to how, uh, you know, we need to rejig, uh, you know, the global supply chain being concentrated in just one or two places. Uh, and, and I think it is a, natu a natural policy reflex uh, for the Indonesian government. Uh, and it will be hopefully a natural uh, execution reflex. Uh, now, uh, one thing to highlight is that, you know, if we want to start industrializing or reindustrializing or reshoring, I think we've got to be very sensitive to where we are or where we stack up in terms of the marginal productivity. And, and I've, been, I've been saying this many times in, in other lectures. Uh, I think we've got to take a view on what we need to do to move up our marginal productivity. Our marginal productivity on a purchasing power parity basis is at a mere $24,000. Okay, that means every, on average, every Indonesian can produce about $24,000 of goods and services per person per year. Okay, it doesn't compare well with the Singaporeans. The Singaporeans are, are at about $130,000. Okay, on average, the Singaporeans can produce $130,000 worth of goods and services per person per year whereas Indonesia is at 24,000. So if we wanna basically reshore or reindustrialize or further industrialize, we've gotta make sure that we are productive and we are marginally productive and we're marginally efficient and effective. But if we're not, our products are not gonna be as competitive as those that are made by countries that are actually much more marginally productive. So that I think involves a further view taking on education a further view taking on sourcing, you know, raw materials and also further view taking on basically completing the picture of the supply chain. And that, that is not an, uh, you know, an exercise that could be done overnight, but I think it's a kind of exercise that would be done in years, but, but it does require long-term thinking and long-term, uh, you know, uh, view taking. Uh, but, but I do believe that, that is likely to happen on the back of this policy reflex that's happening not only in Indonesia, but I think it's already happening uh, in, in, in many other economies. Good morning, uh, Gita. Morning. Uh, my name is Zulfian Pa. I'm a trade economist at Institute for Development and Economic and Finance, or INDEF. Um, I really like your talk uh, about this issue, but I think uh, it will be great to hear your views on the threat or protectionism uh, policies currently happening across the globe, uh, and especially also in Indonesia, because right now, because I understand that many countries, their lack of medical equipment, products, or goods, so the logic is they close the barriers to fulfill their own needs in their domestic market. But on the other hand, uh, many countries also, just like you mentioned, uh, like Trump uh, attacking 3M for not exporting or sending a mask to the US because they produce it in China. 
So it's a similar policy with the Indonesia currently. So one hand, Indonesia, they close their borders, they stop exports of medical goods or equipments to other countries. But on the other hand, they are uh, desperately asking help from other countries to send the uh, medical products to Indonesia. So there is inconsistent uh, policies here. And it's not only Indonesia, but also across the globe. What do you think about this uh, phenomenon and what do you suggest for Indonesian authorities, Ministry of Trade, or even to the world? Thank you, Pat. That's, that's, that's a good question. Look, I've, I've, I've been, I've been um, saying, you know, in, in numerous occasions and past lectures about how the last, I would argue, 10 years, the world has become more and more polarized, okay? And, and the polarization of conversation, which has taken people to the far right and to the far left, unfortunately has taken place at the expense of the diminution of center and the diminution of the centrality, okay? This has complicated conversations, okay? Be it politically, but also economically, and also geopolitically. Okay, as a result of this polarization or increasing polarization, we have seen a more bilateralized uh, view taking on everything as opposed to multilateralized view taking on everything. Okay, and that has been uh, affected, uh, that has been reflected in the failures of the TPP uh, framework discussion. Okay. And that has been reflected in a number of other multilateral uh, you know, framework discussions. Yes, we could argue that the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, framework uh, seems to be getting traction more than the TPP, but, but I think it's on the basis that the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, I think caters uh, more to the developing economy mindset as opposed to the more developed economy mindset. Uh, and, and that actually was the very reason why TPP failed, because they were too busy or the member countries were too busy intellectualizing the conversation as opposed to popularizing the conversation. Okay. Now, I think what people don't recognize or realize is that the underlying theme, you know, beneath this polarization and increased bilateralization is actually uh, the Gini ratio of many countries that has been rising, okay? Anytime, anywhere you have higher inequality or higher Gini ratio, that seems to be the underlying force for basically increased nationalism, increased bilateralism, less multilateralism, and things that actually do not reflect the necessary components of the global economy or globalization. Now, the COVID-19, unfortunately and sadly, I think has punctuated that even further because sadly we're seeing, you know, a number of episodes or phenomena in a, in a number of countries where, you know, a blame game has started, okay, as opposed to, uh, you know, collectively, you know, resolving attitudes. Uh, we're not seeing the G7, we're not seeing the G20, we're not seeing ASEAN, we're not seeing the Euro, you know, collectively actually coming up with a solution. Why? Because each country is too busy trying to figure out a solution for, for itself, much less how can they figure out a solution for the other guys in the association. So that I think has made bilateralization more pronounced. Now, I, I don't mean to, to actually portray a darker picture here, but, but you know, beneath or, or beyond COVID-19, we need to actually contemplate, okay, other possibilities that could complicate the conversation. And these other possibilities, I think, could include white swan uh, events, you know, from a geopolitical standpoint, be it what could possibly happen in North Korea, be it what could possibly happen in South China Sea, be it what could happen with Iran, be it what could happen with some other places that could complicate the geopolitics of things. That, I think, is going to further punctuate uh, the bilateralization of conversations around the world. So expect in the next few years, uh, less multilateral uh, conversations, be it on trade 
or on economic uh, and other matters. Well, um, I hope you are doing well. Um, yeah. Work together. Um, now I'm looking at Grab. I'm working specifically on considerable issues, so very much related to public policy and how that affects our institution. Um, but my question will be about our future, but, um, specifically our equilibrium. Right? So we know that um, Jakarta has started implementing this PSBB, um, and then probably more stringent measure will follow uh, at the next you know, um, region in Indonesia, right? Um, in my opinion, this will not be sustainable in, in short run. You know, we can just keep on locking down and, um, and not actually have any economic activity, right? Um, and you know that the vaccine or drugs will not be default in, in actually in short run. And um, so what will be our equilibrium? But do you think we would need to coexist with the virus eventually and just take it as, as it is? And what will happen to the economy in this case? Because looking at our healthcare system, it seems unprepared to actually um, face, um, to coexist with this virus, like, like Wuhan, for example, who started to actually reverse the lockdown. Um, that's my first question. But my second question will be um, your comment about the testing rate, right? Um, at the beginning of March, when, when I saw the data, we are the second worst in the world in terms of um, tests per million people. Last week, I last checked, it was the fourth worst in the world. Looking at our slow pace, um, it doesn't seem to be like um, increasing at, at any faster rate that the urgency that you're facing is, is actually quite big. Um, do you think there is like a political factor um, vis-a-vis uh, -vis health carrier, or, or this, this is just a health care problem. There's some kind of like a political economic issue behind all of this the fact that our testing rate is so slow. Um, so, your question. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, look, uh, the, the first one is with respect to whether or not we're going to be able to reach a new equilibrium. Uh, I, I have suggested that, you know, we are going through three types of shocks, right? the shock of over-information, the shock of lifestyle, and the shock of frequent policy responses at multi-levels, right? And, and this, I think, has brought us to a new norm, okay? And, and I, I, I just want to stress that this new norm is only going to be punctuated, right, in the future by way of what could possibly come. What I mean by that is twofold. Number one is that you know, the current COVID-19 virus is actually a mutation of the, Mar the SARS virus in 2002. It started out in November 2002 and it lapsed until about July or August 2003. It's the same virus, but it's a more, uh, you know, you, could, you can call it a more concerning mutation or derivative of the same virus. Now, is it possible that this new mutation is going to even further mutate? Absolutely. Medically speaking, it is possible. Nothing is impossible from a medical standpoint. So I think the only thing that you got to basically quantify is whether or not it's going to be a worse mutation or a better mutation, right? Now, you know, planning ahead, I think you got to, you got to think conservatively that it is possible or it is not an impossibility for this to be a worse mutation in the future. Whether or not it's going to happen a year from today or 20 years from today, I don't know. I'm not a medical expert, but I can tell you this. Before that happens, there's still likely to be a secondary outbreak or a relapse. As with every virus or every bacteria that any human being suffers from, okay? And that, you know, we can, we can take, you know, reference from, you know, Mark Lipsitch, you know, the famous ep epidemiologist who's basically said that, you know, potentially up to 50% of the adult population uh, could be infected in the next year or two. And that's not just by way of the spread that's ongoing right now, but that's also by way of what could potentially occur by way of a relapse or a secondary outbreak, okay? So what I mean by this is that as we go through the evolving stages, okay, of what we're going through right now, and what we're gonna be going through in terms of an outbreak, uh, you know, a secondary outbreak, and also in terms of, a, you know, a newly mutated virus, which could happen sometime in the future, uh, not every human being is gonna survive, okay? Uh, everybody's immune system is differential, 
with respect to everybody else's, okay? And that I think is the new kind of equilibrium. So uh, I, I would basically advocate for, you know, as many people as possible to basically just, uh, you know, get more fit than ever, because I think the concern about a more, you know, concerning, um, you know, mutation of the, the ongoing virus is, is a real possibility. So that's on the first question. So there is going to be a new equilibrium where our lifestyle is going to be different. I, I, I think we're, we're going to be a lot less communal going forward, at least in the next few years by way of what we're going through right now. I think we're going to be a lot more cautious in terms of, you know, getting together with five or 10 people. Uh, we're going to get more cautious and partying. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot more virtual. You know, uh, I think we're going to get a lot less communal, a lot more virtual. And that, I think, translates to, you know, impairment of certain value propositions, uh, inclusive of commercial real estate. You know, uh, we have realized as of today that, you know, we could almost as effectively, as productively, as efficiently work from home as we would from the office, right? And, and that, in a way, translates to a value depression or value compression for offices, right? I think it's going to enhance or it could enhance the value proposition of residential real estate. I'm not trying to be a marketer or seller here of, of any particular proposition. And, and on the second question with respect to whether or not the policy on PSBB is, is, is correct or not, I, I, I want to give, I think, uh, the government the benefit of the doubt here in that, you know, uh, intuitively, it is better to just lock down because we don't know, you know, whether or not, you know, the, the, the object driver that we're going to ride the motorcycle on is infected or not. We don't know whether the grocery guy is infected or not. It's better to just stay home. It's better to just wear masks even at home. It's better to just keep on washing our hands and all that. I, I think that's the, the, the better alternative to take in the absence of clarity on how the transmission has been. But it doesn't discount the need for anybody, particularly the government, to do massive testing. You know, I, I've been saying this, you know, in my tweets and, and to many people that I've talked to, you know, it's, 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 it's not so good that we're only testing 113 on a per million basis when, you know, the Singaporeans are doing 12,000 on a per million basis and the Koreans are doing 8,000 tests on a per million basis. So what does it take to ramp up from 113 to 7,000, 10,000 or 12,000? It's going to take a lot more than the 75 trillion rupees that's been allocated by the government. So uh, at the moment, I think the PES Bebe, I think, is a better choice of action, uh, you know, than uh, nothing, than doing nothing. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in the near foreseeable future, I think we've got to be able to better measure uh, the transmission so that we can have a more selective lockdown so that there is a re you know um, cycling of the wheels of economy thank you so much for your interesting explanation especially uh about the national situation in terms of uh indonesia position at the global level yeah but uh i also get a suggestion from your side that uh in the end uh self-sufficiency we as a nation is much more important uh, in this situation. Uh, in regards to the different, uh, the wide spectrum of socio-economic differences of Indonesia, and as well as the impact of COVID, the spread of COVID at present in Indonesia is also uh, focused on uh, Jabodetabek and West Java and Bandung area. Uh, I like your opinion on what shall we do now in terms of uh, geographically strategy or policy because you know uh, before this COVID we also know that this year there will be 200 something election, local election and we know exactly the situation at local level and uh, which sector especially shall we focus on so we can uh, together minimize the impact of COVID to the welfare of the 
people at grassroots level. Thank you so much, Pak Gita. Uh, by the way, I'm Ramalis from Tunas Nusa Foundation uh, Research on Urban Development. Thank you. Uh, I think we can assume that right now the most resilient uh, sector is that which relates to our day-to-day -day basic needs, i.e. food, right? i.e. the agricultural sector, i.e. the fisheries. Uh, and, and that, I think, has not been disrupted. But I want to just caution uh, people that there is a risk of that being distorted and that being disrupted. Uh, imagine the scenario where a farmer who needs to till the land and, and he needs to basically get his equipment fixed and by way of a particular PSBB policy within his region, the toko bangunan or the shop that sells the equipment needs to be closed off. The farmer cannot get his equipment fixed to the extent that he cannot get his equipment fixed. I'm not suggesting that it's happening already, but it could, okay? I just want to be extra cautious here. Now, to the extent that there is a disruption in his ability to get his equipment fixed, then there is likely to be a negative supply shock within the agricultural sector. Now, now as, relate, as it relates to the political dimension of things, right, by way of this physical distancing policies that have been implement, implemented by the government, uh, I think it's time for people to actually, you know, consider coming up with an alternative method of politicizing. Okay. And, and we've been very, very encouraged by the digitization of the marketplaces so that people could buy and sell, you know, over the digital landscape. How about using the same kind of platform uh, for purposes of politicizing? Okay. That, I think, in a way, is part of what we have to consider doing within the new norm or within the new equilibrium or within the new paradigm. Because I, I don't foresee in the near foreseeable future uh, our ability to basically go out in big crowds, you know, for politicizing, be it voting, be it campaigning, be it, you know, whatever it takes for you to politicize. Uh, I don't see it as, as a wise choice of action uh, as of now, even in the near foreseeable future. Uh, again, we have to be sensitive to the possibility of this mutating, this uh, relapsing uh, in, in the next few months. So in the context of these you know, regional elections that are coming, uh, I, I think at at the end of the day, we've got to put the highest priority on one's health as opposed to one's political health. I think the physical health is far too important, far more important than anybody's political health at the moment. Um, and the Ramani? sector? Which sector do you think? Um, basic I, I sector. Did say, yeah? Basic I, I sector. I did say agriculture. Agriculture. Okay, agriculture. And geographic point of view? Urban, oh perlu, outside Java? Oh, I, I, I think, you know, we've got a lot of uh, ocean. Uh, that's a great sector to dwell into. And we've got a lot of, uh, you know, aerial uh, land, uh, not particularly in Java, but other places, Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi. Yes, you could argue that, you know, there's higher degree of fertility in, in, in the aerability of, of, of land in Java. But, you know, with, with the use of technology that's being used in, you know, some places in the world, such as Israel or other parts of the Middle East, where it has been arid for hundreds of years, but it's turned around in a big way, you know, in terms of its fertility. I, I can't see how we're not going to be able to turn fertility around in, in other places beyond Java. So that, that, I think, is something to consider. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Yani. I'm from Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy. So um, it's been very interesting and uh, yeah, I really enjoy uh, this, uh, but my question would be, actually you have touched 
uh, this before, Pagita. So it's about the G20. So as I understand, the G20 Health Minister meeting is coming, I think, in around next week. So how do you think the G20 could actually be an opportunity, especially for our country, to deliver the concern that we have right now? You mentioned that probably uh, every country uh, is now busy with taking care of uh, the issue in their countries. But so what do you think? Like it would be just a normative issues, uh, it normative concern, or how do you think it, it will be able to be an opportunity for uh, us as well? And the second question would be that I have re been reading that several countries, they actually use, uh, they, implement, uh, they implement the COVID-19 policy based on uh, the data, like they use a lot of data, uh, quantitative data. So how do you think that our country could actually uh, maybe try or yes, to to use data to uh, make the policy in regard to COVID. Thank you, Pagita. Look, I, I, I think the, you know, I, I used to be asked, uh, you know, by people about the difference between ASEAN and the Euro zone, right? And, and, you know, many people have always, you know, admired how the Euro has been able to unionize itself uh, from a monetary standpoint. They have a common currency. From an immigration standpoint, you know, you don't need passports if you're a member of the 20 states, 27 members. Uh, whereas ASEAN doesn't have a unionized, you know, monetary system. We don't have a common currency, uh, nor do we have a common immigration or a unionized immigration. Some countries in ASEAN still require you to, to, to get a visa, right? But, but I, I counter that uh, observation or argument uh, with, with the following. Uh, I think, you know, the beauty about ASEAN is that we meet uh, not with a purpose, but we meet for the sake of meeting, right? And as a result of meeting for the purpose of meeting, we get to understand better each other. And, and let's not forget, uh, there are members or there is a member of ASEAN that has a GDP per capita of more than $60,000. And there's another member of ASEAN that has a GDP per capita of less than $2,000. So you can imagine if these two guys are stuck in a room, inevitably, if they meet 17, 17 times in a year, inevitably, they're going to have a much better understanding of each other, right? So when somebody says, I'm sorry, I'm not joining TPP, the other guy who's earning $60,000 a year or more has a good understanding as to why the guy that earns less than $2,000 a day is not joining. Because this guy is not ready for a conversation on intellectual property. He's not ready on a conversation for a conversation on human rights infringement. He's not ready because he just, he is too worried about being able to put food on the table for his family. He is too worried about being able to put brick on top of brick so that the factory gets built. And that factory is not even a factory of microchips. It's only a factory of shoes, a factory of the basic ingredients of day-to-day -day lifestyle, right? So my, 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 my point to you is I think G20, you know, as much as the ministerial meeting is gonna take place soon, I think it's gonna be net beneficial in the sense that you know, each member is gonna be able to share and tell stories with each other as to what problems they're encountering and how they're actually encountering these problems or they're combating these problems. So that, that storytelling, I think it's gonna be positive in the sense that it allows for some sort of an informal, hopefully formal success transfer. Now, whether or not it's gonna translate or dovetail into a collective measure that's going to be good for all members, I'm not so sure. Whether or not it's going to dovetail into a collective measure or set of steps that's going to be good for the rest of the global economy, I'm not so sure. Okay? But what I pointed out earlier is that as much as the G20 economies make up more than 50% of the global economy, I don't think they're in a position to actually be able to lend support in a global manner yet, merely because of the magnitude of the problems that each member country has to deal with right now. Now, will that change over time? I think it would. I think it would change over time as we 
see a dissuading you know nature of the problem in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months but as of today i would i would not bet on a, on on some sort of a collective measure that would help resolve you know everybody's problems instantaneously but the fact that everybody's sharing stories with each other uh, i think uh, has a net positive effect uh, thank you so much pagita i'm wisnu ibisono i'm from cdp carbon disclosure project and i'm really glad to have your lecture it was really clear uh, and I, uh, in this opportunity, I would like uh, to ask several questions because it's, this is a very rare opportunity for me. First, just now you mentioned about quantitative easing and its impact on inflation. Do you think by doing the quantitative easing, there will be a risk of hyperinflation? And if no, uh, what would be the steps that the government needs to take to ensure that the government could manage the inflation post the COVID-19 situation? And my second question would be uh, on the uh, ratings, because just now you touch a bit on the ratings. I want to talk about the sovereign ratings, because right now I, I believe that Indonesian uh, country rating is triple B, and it's, I think it's the lowest on the investment grade. And what do you think, will it be uh, like go down and then will be out of investment grade? And will it go down? And if it's go down, what do you think will be the impact on our uh, recovery economies? Because I think it's very important for us to have a good sovereign uh, rating uh, to prepare for our recoveries. And my last question would be uh, on the payroll, because just now you touched uh, quite a bit on the payroll. Uh, do you think that seeing the situation in the future that there will be a shift on how, on policy, on companies need to provide a reserve requirement or uh, like the the banks they have like the GWM giro wajib minimum maybe it's a different concept but i was thinking will be there a policy on reserve requirement or reserve fund so that in the future if this kind of situation happen at least at least these companies don't have to mm. they still have to rely on government but at least they could have yeah. like a one or two month uh, life support from that uh, from that reserve fund. So yeah, that would be my question. Thank you. Okay, okay. all right. Look, on, on, on the first one, I've, I've kind of touched on it, uh, whether or not quantitative easing is gonna entail inflationary tendencies. Uh, I, I think it's safe to say it is. Uh, it is likely to entail uh, in inflationary tendencies, but there, there's, there are ways to mitigate that risk, okay? Uh, the, the, the way to mitigate the risk is that as long as the liquefaction of the economy is for purposes of replacing your earlier day-to-day -day income, which had disappeared, right? So that you could actually maintain your lifestyle, right? So that you could actually buy the food that you need to feed your family. Uh, it shouldn't be too inflationary, right? Unless there is hoarding. If you start hoarding food supplies, there is going to be inflationary tendencies more than normal, okay? Unless the sellers of the foods uh, start basically cornering the markets because they know that now you are getting the money from the government, uh, then there is likely to be inflationary tendency, right? Now, the other the step to mitigate the risk is to make sure that the liquefaction of the economy is not at the moment for capital expenditure purposes, okay? Investasi jangka panjang. If this money were to actually be showered upon people so that they could actually start buying materials for construction, materials for capital expenditure, you are more likely to see a hyperinflationary environment. Why? Because at the moment, any capital expenditure is exposed to anything that has been disrupted from a supply chain standpoint. Okay? You want to get uh, uh, a shower uh, for your bathroom, uh, more than likely that shower is going to be manufactured in China, okay? And at the rate that the factories in China are just slowly coming back to the factories, the employees are slowly coming back to the factories, you're not going to be able to get that shower in time. You're not going to be able to get that shower at the same price that you would have gotten maybe three months ago, okay? By way of that negative supply shock on whatever you need. So one is to maintain or preserve your lifestyle without any augmentation of your lifestyle. 
it's different. If you get the money and you get more than what you need and you start buying Ferraris, right? That's going to be inflationary. Number two, it's different. If you start buying things that are capital expenditure in nature, that's going to be inflationary. So if, if you mitigate those two risks, I think we should be able to foresee a moderately inflating environment as opposed to hyper uh, inflating environment. Now, uh, the, the second question is with respect to the re-ratings, okay? I think the re-ratings of corporations and countries are likely to happen. Uh, unless there is less objectivity in the way people look at or rate companies, okay? But the way ratings companies look at corporations or sovereignties, they, they have a certain set of objective criteria or metrics which have to be fulfilled to the extent that those metrics are not fulfilled. That only affects uh, re-rating. Now, I think, I, I think if we were to actually come up with this necessary policy reflex or refle uh, response, that would actually buoy the economy on a sustained basis, uh, I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that we're not likely to get re-rated downward, okay? Unless there is an absence of basically quickness which with, with which we respond. There is an absence of you know, delivery to the people that actually need the support. Uh, then I think the possibility or even the risk of a re-rating uh, is, is, is more, you know, uh, quantifiable. Now, I think another way to look at this is that, you know, uh, the liquefaction of the economy uh, should be of wisdom also, right? And, and the wisdom could be infused in the liquefaction narrative by way of the governments and the peoples, hopefully, paying attention or being sensitive to uh, our need to be more environmentally friendly, Okay. The, the, the fact that we're actually showing signs that we want to use this money for anything that's going to be more environmentally friendly, I think it's going to be more encouraging than anything you could ever imagine, okay? Because this is apt and timely. At a time when the oil price has plummeted to around $20 per barrel, right, I, I think it only punctuates the need for humanity to actually start thinking about using alternative energy, okay? And, and I think if countries or governments or people from Indonesia would actually consider using the liquidity support for purposes of, pur purposes, purposes of actually preserving the climate, that I think is going to be considered, uh, you know, by any agencies around the world uh, that are in charge of rating, you know, us as a sovereignty or as an economy or even corporations. And, and, and the third bit, uh, I forgot the third question all of a sudden. Yeah, uh, it's more on policy on uh, reserve fund. Uh, oh, yeah, there, okay, got uh, it. Future, yeah. Yeah, I got it. Now, there was a thing called social security, all right? Uh, Singapore has it. They, they call it CPF, right? CPF is actually designed as a deduction from people's payroll so that they could basically be covered on a rainy day when they get sick or when they get, God forbid, you know, paralyzed or whatever, but also in times of trouble like this. And, and this is exactly why the Singapore government, which has accumulated massive amounts of reserves by way of what they have collected from the people, and also the corporations, uh, they've been able to basically come up with a, a, a large stimulus package, you know, amounting to about 12% of the GDP, as opposed to Indonesia only amounting to about 2.5%. So now, can we argue for the corporations to actually set aside, uh, you know, some sort of an escrow or some sort of a reserve for, you know, future rainy days uh, for themselves and the, the employees? I think you could consider doing that, but, but the, the, the problem is that, you know, different sectors uh, vary in terms of the, you know, p &L dynamics, right? Uh, some sectors could actually earn, earn on a 30% margin. Some sectors could earn on, on a much less, you know, uh, percentage of margin. So that, that I think will, will, will have to be reflected in the degree to which you can actually put aside for future rainy days. So I, 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 I don't 
I don't foresee a scenario where the government could mandate, you know, a one pill for all uh, in terms of a policy of setting up reserves. Uh, but, but I do foresee a scenario where maybe the government should take a deduction uh, for rainy days for, for, you know, both the corporation and the employees.